Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's show is stellar spectroscopy. And here to tell us all about this fascinating topic is our guest, Julia Marsh. Julia, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. You're very, very welcome. So uh, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself, please. Well, um, I am an astrophysics student at ASU, Arizona State University. I also uh, work with you at Cranbrook in Bloomfield Hills. I love everything related to astronomy, but in particular, I'm very interested in the history of astronomy and how we've gotten uh, to where we are. All right, and stellar spectroscopy really has a good historical background uh, to it. So what were the origins of spectroscopy? Yes, uh, so the origins of spectroscopy uh, go back to the late 1700s, early 1800s, starting with Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton did a famous experiment using a prism, and he showed that when light passes through a prism, it's broken into uh, seven colors. So that's everyone's pretty familiar with that story. Oh, yes, yes. Um, in, it's a little bit of a tall tale. Um, people knew that if you shined a light through a prism that you would get all of these different colors. But what people didn't know is that the colors weren't intrinsic to the prism. Uh, during that time, you had um, a lot of people wondering what the true nature of color was. And so with prisms, um, you know, Newton was able to really definitively show that light was not something, um, was, it, was its own quality, that color was the result of light. And light is made up of all those colors. Correct. Right. Okay. Yes. And when that light passed through the prism, you're able to see them in a full spectrum or a rainbow. Exactly. So um, the 1600s uh, was a time of revolution uh, in optics and astronomical observation. Uh, can you tell our viewers why that is? What, what's behind all that? Oh my gosh, so much. There was so much happening um, just if you think in terms of technology, there were so many innovations happening. Optics was this brand new field and people were going crazy. You had Galileo looking at the heavens for the first time through a telescope, constantly tinkering and improving on his designs and seeing more and more. Um, discovering that the Milky Way was actually made of thousands of stars that could be resolved when looked at through a telescope. It wasn't just uh, a lake pouring through, uh, <laughs> through the heavens. And as this technology advanced, there were a lot of questions about light and the nature of light, which brings us back to Newton. Uh, people were also very excited about magnification. Uh, they were looking at everything they could, looking in glasses, looking at water, looking at microbes. And in the early 1800s, um, I believe it was uh, William Boyle um, looked at a, a uh, spectrum created by a prism with a magnifying glass. This was, in a lot of ways, the first uh, a very crude uh, form of spectroscopy. And when he did, he saw these black lines or gaps uh, between the colors. And he couldn't explain what they were. And sadly, he passed away before he could investigate any further. Um, but 
this was really where the birth of spectroscopy begins. Okay, so about the time with Newton, this other gentleman that was actually discovering these dark lines that mm -hmm. we know exactly what they are today, but yes. in his time, it was a mystery. Yes, and after, so this was a little bit after Newton, um, there weren't that many elements that had been uh, discovered by that point. Um, one of the most famous is helium. So helium had not yet been discovered. Do you know how we first discovered helium? No, I do not. Well, I'm gonna see if you can figure this out. It's actually a little bit of uh, the clues in the name, helium. Wouldn't have to do with Helios, mm -hmm. the sun? Yes, okay. yes, All right. Helios, All right. the sun god. Because using uh, solar spectroscopy, we were able to discover new elements inside the sun. And helium was one of them. So it was named. Interesting, interesting, interesting uh, indeed. Um, so we had these folks Newton and others working in the, the seven, 1500s or 1600s? 1600s. 1600s. Yeah. Uh, making these initial discoveries and trying to make sense of it all. Yes. Um, exactly. Now, Newton never saw the absorption lines or the dark lines. He was not aware of those, as far as you know? As far as I know. Um, but it is quite possible that he just didn't tell anyone because Newton was a very private man, as you know. Yes. And uh, he was also quite canting uh, cantankerous. He did not like sharing his information with other people. Do you know the story of a history of fishes? No. A history of fishes. Um, so Newton, if we can talk about Newton for a moment. Sure, sure. I love talking about Newton because he was a very unhappy man with very few friends, very few successful relationships, um, and he was very difficult to work with. He was also incredibly brilliant. His friend uh, Halley saw this brilliance and wanted him to share his information with the world, but Newton was absolutely appalled at this idea. He wanted his information to be his own. He didn't want to share it with the rest of the world, and it was only when a rival scientist went to publish um, their uh, discovery or creation of a new form of mathematics called calculus that Halley finally convinced Newton to publish his works. Now, Halley at the time, Edwin Halley was working for the Royal Astronomical uh, Society in um, Great Britain, and he was the secretary. He convinced the uh, Royal Society to publish Newton's book, but only after their next biggest hit, a history of fishes. This is a true story. A history of fishes with beautiful engravings, uh, the most detailed fish you would ever want to see in your lifetime, um, all there for display. It was a huge flop. They lost so much money that they actually paid Edwin Halley in unsold copies of A History of Fishes. Oh, how special is that? Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, and refused to publish Newton's book. So Haley then had to fund it himself oh. as well. Interesting. Interesting. So Newton was working with prisms and color. Mm -hmm. What is color? Yes, color is, uh, we know, the reflection of light. So we know that the blue on your shirt is the reflection of blue, of blue light, the light that wasn't absorbed by the material in your shirt. Exactly. So we didn't always 
know this. You know, uh, think of when you're a young child and you have a red apple. You think that the apple itself is red and it's, that's what our intuition says. It says that this table is brown, your shirt is blue. It's a huge leap to figure out that there's this thing traveling through the air that is giving your shirt color. And so that's what Newton showed us, that light, in fact, um, is where color comes from. So it's not intrinsic to the object, but as you say, it's that wavelength of light that was not absorbed by that particular object. Yep. All right. So you were talking earlier, too, about optics. Um, yes. What about Newton's optics? Well, Newton uh, created the Newtonian reflector. Yes, he did. As I, mm -hmm. yep. Um, big fan. <laughs> um, and he, he was really, um, just really focused on our perceptions of light, light's applications. Um, you know, that's uh, light is where he came up with uh, the inverse square law. Uh, if uh, for our viewers that are familiar, um, when you have a candle flame, as you walk away from the flame, it gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. But Newton showed that gravity, um, the effects of gravity dim, so to say, at the same rate as light. Oh, okay. So by working with his, his optics, he was able to develop that, I don't know if I want to call it a theory, if that's the right term, or? Many different theories relating to light and reflection and absorption. Okay, sounds like uh, he did quite, quite a job. Yes. We're going to take a quick break right here. Um, if you have any questions, send us an email. Um, as always, you can see the email address down at the bottom of your spring screen. And uh, right after term of the month with Stephen, we'll be back with more stellar spectroscopy. Thanks, Don. The term of the month is astronomical spring. We've covered spring before, but have decided to go with astronomical spring, given that astronomical distance is like normal distance, but more so, you might expect something like that for astronomical spring. In the Northern Hemisphere, like the United States, Germany, Canada, and the UK, the astronomical vernal equinox is taken as the first day of spring, which lasts until the summer solstice. The vernal equinox is when the subsolar point appears to cross the celestial equator. Now, the celestial equator is the equator with respect to the Earth's rotation axis, which tilts with respect to the Earth's orbit around the Sun by about 23.44 degrees. Most people say that an equinox is when the day and night are about the same length. This happens from about March 19th to March 21st. We would cover solar spring, but as it goes from February 1st to the first day of May, and this is the May show, that ship has sailed. It's already solar summer. And that totally explains this image taken near Detroit on Michigan on the day after Easter this year. No, it doesn't. And that's term of the month, astronomical spring. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome back. We're here with our guest, Julia Marsh, talking about stellar spectroscopy. So, Julia, in, I think it was 1802, a man named William Wollaston observed spectral lines. Uh, why was this important? Yes. Uh, so... When he looked at light that had passed through a prism and projected a rainbow, he took a closer look at the rainbow and found dark lines that we call spectral lines. Now, you can't see these dark spectral lines when you look at 
a rainbow without some form of magnification. Um, but he found that whenever he looked at the sun, he kept seeing the same spectral lines um, over and over again, but he wasn't able to investigate it further. It wasn't until a gentleman known as uh, Fraunhofer, Josef Fraunhofer, mm -hmm. uh, that we really started to figure out something was going on with these dark lines, with these spectral lines. And so it was his research that really led us to figure out what these were? His empirical uh, evidence led us to a discovery. So who I really want to talk about is Dr. Um, Dr. Robert Bunsen. Okay. And his story begins with Fraunhofer. So uh, Dr. Robert Bunsen and um, Dr. Gustav Kirchhoff, um, both pictured here, uh, Kirchhoff is the shorter of the two, and they work together to really form modern spectroscopy, and they transformed just our total understanding of the universe. Without them, there would be no way for us to travel around the universe. Astrophysics basically wouldn't exist without these two scientists and their contributions. But let's go back to Fraunhofer's spectral lines. Okay. So Fraunhofer's spectral lines, um, he didn't know why these were appearing, but he mapped them out. So um, just the same way that Kepler uh, created his three laws of planetary motion based off of empirical evidence collected by uh, Tycho, uh, Fraunhofer's lines, um, he put together about 200 of these lines, of maps of these lines. He would look at the sun, look at bright stars like Sirius, but there wasn't a lot that he could do to really look closer at, um, to find out what these lines were. Of course, now we know that atoms like hydrogen every atom in the universe will emit an emission spectrum if it's heated, which are colorful lines uh, that appear. And then inversely, we have absorption spectrums, which happens when uh, materials like your blue shirt uh, absorb uh, color, then we can see that color absorbed. But we'll go, I'll go more into that in uh, just a moment. Okay, so we've, we've seen where uh, Josef Fraunhofer has been mapping all of these lines, and then mm -hmm. we're introduced to Robert Bunsen and Gustav Kirchhoff. Yes! So. The heroes of this story. <laughs> all right, do tell. So, um, first of all, Dr. Robert Bunsen was just an amazing human being. He was uh, remembered as being an amazing uh, a human from his uh, colleagues, his friends, his students. He uh, would often teach introductory classes that his other uh, colleagues found uh, were beneath them. And he would take a lot of time with his students as a teacher um, and inspired a lot of great chemists uh, throughout his career. He created the antidote to arsenic, which we still use today, and he created the Bunsen burner. A staple in every chem lab in the country. A yep. staple. Yep. Because before that, to do any kind of experiments with gas and light, you had to use a candle. And so he created this device, which by the way, he did not patent because he didn't believe in profiting over um, uh, bringing progress to uh, scientific studies. Okay. Um, so he he never pant, uh, patent uh, got a patent mm -hmm. for the Bunsen burner. So he and Kirchhoff did two experiments. 
one were the superheated gases and looked at them through a spectroscope. Again, light passing through a prism and being magnified. And they found emission lines. So just like the hydrogen atom, uh, which is, uh, the hydrogen atom is always a good one to look at because it's the simplest atom. It's uh, what uh, a joke I always love that you make, uh, you can't trust atoms. They make up everything, yes. And hydrogen is practically everything. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's the most abundant, and uh, when it's superheated, it makes this pattern of four lines, and that's an emission spectrum. The hydrogen atom, every atom when it's heated will release a certain amount of energy uh, that is unique to that atom and that temperature. Kirchhoff also found that if you looked at light that was passing through a gas, a cooler gas, that hydrogen or any other element, instead of creating lines, those would be the lines that were missing the black gaps. Uh-huh. All right. And that is modern spectroscopy. We still look for those black lines, but the thing to take away is that every atom has its own unique signature. So if we take light from a star, or light from a distant planet, or light from a distant galaxy, even if we, uh, just by looking at these spectral lines, we can tell what atoms are present. And from that, we can infer speed, mass. Um, we know the elements that are there. Mm -hmm. It's quite elemental. Indeed. And uh, spectroscopy is truly uh, the study of rainbows with a mission. Indeed. Indeed. Now, you were talking about Bunsen and mm -hmm. the Bunsen burner. Why did they feel they had to invent that? What Be was the purpose? Uh, so they could control temperature. Uh, color is deeply tied to temperature. So just like a stove, as it gets, uh, or if you have a stove and you turn on the, um, you know, the burner, the flame, the flame uh, starts out red. What color does it turn as it gets hotter? Mm -hmm. There it goes to orange and then yellow. We know the temperature is increasing. Yep, yep. yep. And so color is related to temperature. And so the Bunsen burner just gave them uh, unprecedented control. Okay, give them a constant versus the flickering of a candle. Exactly. It's maybe somebody opens the door and the flame flickers and the, yeah, mm -hmm. where this is much more controlled. Interesting, yeah. It's everybody's, I think, we had a, a chemistry class in high school or college that Bunsen burner, I mean, it's, yeah, a staple indeed. Birth of modern astrophysics. This ushered that in, okay, to, mm -hmm. to where we are today? That's right. Okay. So it, it sounds like uh, these gentlemen that we've been speaking about, uh, we owe a debt of gratitude for what we are able to know today and know things that we, places we can't travel to to study. Yes. Yeah. And just imagine that someone just mapping these lines without knowing what they were, you know, without doing that or, or without um, inventing a simple tool for a simple um, experiment, we might not know that the universe is expanding. That's true. Something, something to think about. Julia, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show this month to uh, inform us on this fascinating topic. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, please visit our website. Uh, the email or the web address, I should say, is down at the bottom of your screen. And uh, coming up next, as always, is Stephen with What's Up in the Night Sky.
Thanks, Don. What's up in the night sky for May 2022? The sun goes from Aries to Taurus over May. These are constellations that you won't see this month. In the Northern Hemisphere, days get longer more slowly. South of the equator, days get shorter more slowly. We have a brand new set of moon images courtesy of Jay Starble. April, need, uh, April ended with a new moon, so May's first quarter is the first quarter on the 8th. Full moon is on the 18th, uh, 16th, the third quarter is on the 22nd, and a new moon on the 30th in this 31-day month. Uranus is in areas where the sun is and has superior conjunction on the 5th, so it pa passes behind the sun. Mercury is in Taurus where the sun is and has uh, inferior conjunction on the 21st. That is, Mercury passes on our side of the sun, but it isn't a transit. Mercury is not an easy target this month either. Then we have Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Neptune, Vesta, which is a minor planet, Saturn, and Pluto. Consider that all of these planets and objects are better at the end of the month, or best at the end of the month, although for some it doesn't matter much. Venus goes from Pisces to Aries and rises an hour before sunrise. Mars goes from Aquarius to Pisces and rises two to three hours before sunrise. Jupiter is in Pisces all month and rises an hour before sunrise. Neptune goes from Aquarius to Pisces. Note that Neptune has been an Aquarius for roughly forever, so this is news. It rises about three hours uh, before sunrise. Vesta is magnitude seven. You need at least binoculars, a finder chart, and warm clothes. Saturn is in Capricornus and rises three hours before sunrise. And that is what's up in the night sky for May 2022. Remember, we don't charge money for this show, but we may tax your brain.